All right. So I'm not sure if this is actually recording or not. But all right, so here's the deal. Welcome, everybody. Um, I first and foremost want to apologize. My first recording didn't actually save properly. Um, it wasn't an issue on my end like I had originally thought it was. It was something wrong with the Zoom. Uh, the installation that they gave me was incorrect, so they had to give me a new installer. Um, however, it didn't fix the problem. It, it recovered part of some audio, but that was it. So I'm going to do this again, and I'm just going to read and kill some time before I go to, go to bed here. It's just about 8 o'clock, so it took me just about two hours to do this the last time with some interruptions and shit. Um, so with that being said, as I did before, I'm going to do a nice little offering to the ancestors, a thank you for everything that they've done to get us this far to this point. Because as we all know, we've all been here before. This has all been done before. Nothing new under the sun. I want to first and foremost thank my parents for watching over me through all of this redemption shit. It has been a journey to say the least, an enlightening journey. Learning a lot about myself. Learning more about those around me. To friends, to family, to the ancestors, thank you. Namaste. Almost had it over. All right. So here we go for the second time tonight. <coughs> Chapter one, operating in a fiduciary world. In this chapter, becoming comfortable with the terminology surrounding estates and trust, encapsulating estates and taking care of trusts, preparing and filing tax returns for trusts, estates, and decedents. You may have known for a while that someone close to you has named you as the executor of his or her will. As the trustee of a trust he or she has created, or even as both. That knowledge may make you feel extremely honored while that person's alive and kicking and still able to look after their own affairs. Those warm, fuzzy feelings may come crashing to a halt, however, the day that you hear that your friend has passed away. You're now in charge of the show. All eyes will be on you as you pick up the reins and try to keep this buggy called an estate or a trust moving along at a steady clip while keeping all the promises written down during your friend's lifetime. Responsibility is huge, but so is your potential satisfaction as you honor, your, as you honor his wishes after he's no longer around to appreciate your actions. This chapter is all a jumping off point for understanding what an estate administrator or trustee actually does. Assumes control of someone else's affairs in that way, and in that way, both in a way that's both sensitive to family dynamics and responsive to family needs. Apologies. Mishandled estate and or trust administration can cause permanent family rifts. On the other hand, competent and careful management helps keep the family members happy happy, and the purpose intact. All right, so chapter one, operating in a fiduciary world. In this chapter, becoming comfortable with the terminology surrounding estates and trusts, encapsulating estates and taking care of trusts, preparing and filing tax returns for trusts, estates, and decedents. 
You may have known for a while that someone close to you has named you the trust, uh, the executor of his or her will as a trustee of a trust he or she created, or even as both. That knowledge may make you feel extremely honored while the person's alive and kicking and still able to look after her own assets. Those warm and fuzzy feelings may come to a crashing halt, though, the day you hear that your friend passed away. And now you're in charge of the show. All eyes will be on you as you picked up the reins and tried to keep this buggy called an estate or trust moving along a steady clip while keeping all the promises written down during your friend's lifetime. Responsibility is huge, but so is your potential satisfaction as you honor his wishes after he's no longer around to appreciate your actions. This chapter is a jumping off point for understanding what an estate administrator or a trustee actually does. Assumes control of someone else's affairs in a way that's both sensitive to the family dynamics and responsive to the, fa responsive to the family needs. Mishandled estate and or trust administration can cause permanent family rifts. On the other hand, competent and careful management help keeps the family memories happy and purpose intact. Administering a trust or an estate isn't rocket science, but it does have its own language. One of the biggest stumbling blocks you run across, especially as you're beginning in your new role, is finding out who all the players are and what roles they all play. The following section points out some of the important basic lingo that you need to know as you start your journey. Refer to the other chapters in part one for more on your responsibilities and as, as an administrator or a trustee. Determining an estate's fiduciaries. Several kinds of fiduciaries, people or organizations who hold and administer assets of one person, either living or deceased, for the benefit of that person or another, may be involved in estate administration depending upon whether the will exists and who the heirs are. You may not even be the only fiduciary. In that case, you and the others must act in unison and one person or group can fulfill multiple fiduciary roles, such as when one person is named both executor and trustee. The following are types of fiduciaries you may be named. Executor. The executor is the person named in the will to execute the will, to carry out the wishes of the person making the will, including disposing of the property according to the will. A female executor is sometimes referred to, referred to as an executrix, Although we won't make that distinction in this book, a named executor may decline to act, although we hope this book gives you the confidence to embrace that rule. Administrator. The administrator is a person appointed by the probate court to administer the decedent's estate when the decedent left no valid will. A female administrator may be referred to as administrate. I always have trouble with this word. Administratrix. Administratrix. Administratrix, there we go. Personal representative. The personal representative is a general term for both the executor and the administrator. In some states, this term is used in place of executor or administrator. Guardian. A guardian is the person appointed by the probate court to take care of the person and the property of another person who is considered incapable of taking care of his or her own affairs because of his or her age, often a minor or for other reasons such as mental disability, physical incapacity, or illness. Conservator. A conservator is similar to a guardian, but with less restrictive rules than those for a guardian. For example, the probate court may appoint a conservator for someone who can't properly care for his or her property due to a mental disability or physical incapacity, or for a person missing in action or a prisoner of war. Remember, a probate court rarely appoints a conservator for an estate, especially if you've already been if you've already been appointed as an executor or administrator. However, you may find yourself dealing with already appointed uh, conservator for an estate beneficiary. Remember, just because you're all working with the same set of assets doesn't mean that you belong to the same team. An executor, or, as executor or administrator, you're only responsible for the property owned by the decedent. A beneficiary's conservator is responsible for that beneficiary's interest in said property. Knowing who the trustees are. A trust like an estate must have a fiduciary heading up its team. In this case, a trustee. The trustee of a trust is charged with the task of investing 
trust assets and balancing the desires of the trust creator, the grantor, also referred to as the settler, with the needs of the beneficiary of the present interest. The person or organization entitled to receive the income earned by the trust assets and, depending on the terms of the trust, perhaps some or all of the trust assets themselves. And the wants of the remainder man or the remainder beneficiary, the person or organization who receives what's left of the trust assets after the trust period ends. It may sound daunting, but when done properly, everyone should go home happy. Remember, because balancing these competing interests can be complicated, many grantors choose two or more individuals and or corporations to act together as co-trustees, jointly filling these roles, assigning general powers to and sometimes specific additional powers to certain trustees. In order to differ differentiate between the trustees, trustees are often designated as either independent or family. This section discusses these two types of trustees. Chapter 3 goes into more depth about the different, different types of trusts. All by themselves, independent trustees. Independent trustees or fiduciaries who aren't named in the trust as either grantor, beneficiary, or remainderman can be an important cog in keeping the wheels of trust running smoothly. Whether they're trusted friends of the grantor or our banks, trust companies, lawyers, or accountants, independent trustees owe their primary allegiance to the grantor, who is relying on them to make decisions that, the, that best serve the interest of the trust, rather than that of any present interest beneficiary or remainderman. Frequently, grantors direct an independent trustee to make all decisions regarding discretionary distributions to beneficiaries especially if one of the trust beneficiaries is also a trustee. And in the, case of, in the case of testamentary trusts, the probate court often delegates the power to make discretionary distributions to the independent trustee alone so as to remove any semblance of self-serving from a trustee who has a beneficial or remainder interest in the trust. For example, one of us acts as a trustee for a testamentary trust where the decedent's widow, who is an income beneficiary, and two children, the remainder men, are also trustees. Only the independent trustee may make the decision regarding the distribution of the principal to the widow or the children. Distributions to the children prior to the mother's death require either consent of the independent trustee or the probate judge. Remember, no independent trustee assumes the responsibilities lightly. As a result, oh man, I'm sorry. I'm not even scrolling through stuff. Are you good? We're on the next page now. Let me get over there real quick. I'll zoom out so you can just see the whole page. And then you can zoom in your screen, whatever you got to do. Come on, Fox at PDF. Is that the right page? Yeah. Okay. No independent trustee assumes the responsibilities lightly. As a result, expect to pay for their services unless the independent trustee is a close friend of the grantor who may be willing to perform these services out of a long friendship and the goodness of their heart. Banks and trust companies most likely have pamphlets that list how they calculate their fees because they probably have active custody of the trust assets. They usually collect their fees automatically from the trust. Non-institutional professional trustees, such as attorneys and accountants, bill you for their services. They may charge based on their normally hour rates, but they're more likely to calculate their fees based on a percentage of the market value of the assets of the trust, as well as a percentage of the income collected. Trusts that mandate an independent trustee typically also include a line of succession, 
so that if one trustee is no longer able to act, another in line is able to take his or her place. If the trust requires an independent trustee, make sure that any vacancies are filled promptly because it's next to impossible for the trust to function efficiently without one in place. All in the family, family trustees. Trust grantors often feel that using only professional trustees, as efficient as they may be, may not account for special family circumstances. In these cases, the grantor may choose to also have a family trustee or a trusted member of his or her family who knows the players, presented interest beneficiaries, and, and the remaindermen well and has no difficulty making decisions based on the grantor's wishes. Family trustees usually have, the most, have most of the same powers as independent trustees, such as investment powers and authority to prepare and, and sign income tax returns and to make scheduled di distributions to present interest beneficiaries. Making sure I'm not out of line here. Or remainderman. Warning. It's possible for trust to exist with only a family trustee. Although the results are sometimes messy, somehow, wherever money is concerned, family perceptions or perceptions of appropriate behavior on all sides tend to skew. In our opinion, you're far better off to limit opportunities for self-serving during trust administration by never allowing a family trustee to serve alone. With the addition of an independent trustee, everyone concerned from the grantor to the present interest beneficiary to the trust remainderman can be confident that all the comp all competing interests were considered throughout the administration and that the trustees made appropriate and fair decisions. Another bad idea, having members, having family members be sole trustees of a trust established for their benefit. Unless the trustee slash beneficiary is only entitled to mandatory distributions of the income annually and principal distributions made under very lim limited circumstances, the assets of the trust included in the trustee beneficiary's taxable estate at the time of his or her death, even though the trust property would never be included in the probate estate. If there's also an independent trustee, the grantor can give far more flexibility to, a tr to that trustee to make distributions of income and principal to the beneficiary, and the trust assets still won't be included in that beneficiary's taxable estate upon his or her death. And even through even though the surviving spouse may be the sole trustee of a marital trust for his or her benefit, after all, the property in a marital trust at the time of the surviving spouse's death will be included in his or her taxable estate anyway. <clears throat> in practice, we've seen few trusts where there isn't also an independent trustee, if for only ease of administration. If the surviving spouse is the beneficiary of a trust other than the mar marital trust, an independent trustee can provide more flexible, more flexibility in distributions to the surviving spouse without having trust assets included in his or her estate. Sorry, I went through that whole page without skipping. All right, lining up your team of advisors, no matter whether you've just been named the fiduciary or you're the fiduciary's trusted advisor, you'll probably have times when you really want someone else to explain your options to you or set out the potential pros and cons of a decision you must make. Creating a team of professional advisors before you need the advice is the best way to ensure that. When the time comes to make those decisions, you're able to, to ask for the advice and move forward in a clear measured manner. Chapter four lists the types of advisors you may want to employ and explains how they can help you administer a trust or estate without your surrendering all the fun to them. A state of change, delving into estates. The day a person dies, you're sure to have more on your mind than the fact that you've just assumed a new role. That of the person designated to wrap up the decedent's affairs and yet even while you're wrestling with your personal feelings about the loss, you're somehow supposed to and expected to start tossing all the various balls in the air. You may find yourself planning a funeral at the same time that you're creating the estate calendar, collecting keys to the residence. If the decedent has no surviving spouse, buying the food for the altar funeral, uh, collation, the light meal, 
and figuring out what the decedent owed and owned. In the next sections, we'll, we'll walk, through, walk you through all the steps of administering an estate. Just remember, when all the advice begins to leave you breathless, prioritizing, <clears throat> when it le begins to leave you breathless, prior prioritizing can mean the difference between keeping your sanity and running screaming into the sunset. Scroll up. Altering the status quo. Although losing a friend or loved one may be difficult, you need to realize that person's status is static. Your loved one is dead. Your status as that as an as administrator or executor has also been altered. But that alteration will continue to evolve through the process. You are now responsible for the estate and the decedent's estate and liabilities and assets. Chapter five walks you through the first steps in your new legal role. We help you dive into the decedent's affairs. You gain a sense of what the decedent owned and how he held title to it and thus whether it flows through the probate or estate, who he or she owed money to, and who inherits what's left. You create a calendar with all the estate's important deadlines listed, and you discover the documents, both ones that were created before the decedent's death and others that you've obtained after the death that you need in order to start moving this estate forward. Probating an estate. Probate is a fairly straightforward process of providing court supervision to your administration of an estate. Probate exists for your protection as executor as much as to protect the interest of the estate's heirs and legal tees. With the probate court judge standing between you and their heirs, you have the opportunity to do your job unmolested. And as you do that job, the judge and the court staff check your steps and help you when you need it, making sure that you're doing everything that you should as the executor of the estate You'll start the process by filing the decedent's last will, if there is one, and applying for your administration. You can't finish until the court tells you that you can, when you file the final account and it's allowed. In Chapter 6, you work your way through the probate process, <clears throat> including getting appointed as executor, administrator, or personal representative, fi filing the last will if one exists, notifying heirs and, cre and creditors, and completing the legal documents you're required to file within the court. Collecting the estate's assets. Most of the fun is in administering the estate, at least we think so. It's the digging for buried treasure. Without accurately knowing what is there, you won't know if you'll be required to file an estate tax return or what kind of probate administration you'll need to do. Chapter 7 tells you where and how to dig, including some fairly unusual places, and what to do with those assets after you find them. You also discover how to value property, including when you can do it yourself and when you're better served to have an expert do it for you. <clears throat> get that bottom in there so people can at least pause it. Well, well everybody's going to get a copy of this anyway, so. All right, paying, paying expenses and making distributions. Ooh, this is the fun stuff. Just because the decedent isn't living doesn't mean that he or she doesn't still have expenses. After all, the electricity in the house wasn't turned off at the moment of death, and any mortgage on the residence still needs to be paid. In addition, the estate be begins accumulating its fair shares of costs, whether for accounting and investment services or for lawn mowing. In fact, the estate expenses may look similar to the decedent's before death. As the executor, you're responsible for making sure that the decedents and the estate's bills are paid. Chapter 8 takes you through the expenses you may run across, including the funeral, the first expense the, that most people think about in relation to death. After you pay the estate's bills, you're free to pay off everyone the decedent listed in his or her last will, or the heirs in, at law if he or she died without a valid last will. 
In chapter eight, you will also discover how to slice up what remains of the pie in what order to make the payments and how to transfer the property other than cash and how to mathematically make divisions of property when the dividing line isn't entirely clear. Tying up the estate's loose ends. Even after you've paid everyone, you still need to tidy up some loose ends and uh, some loose odds and ends before you can close the estate. Chapter 9 guides you through all the necessary final steps. You find out what you need to file with the probate court, the IRS, and the decedent state tax authority to obtain the letters releasing you from further responsibility. You also discover all the final flourishes that will bring the estate to its natural conclusion. Operating a trust. Unlike an estate which only exists for a relatively short period of time, we hope, trusts can continue for decades. Depending on the terms of the trust and the age of all the participants, because you're involved for the long haul, the list of what you need to do in the short term and ongoing and, and on an ongoing basis are different. The following sections highlight some of your main tasks as trustee. Whether you've just been appointed or you've, just, or you've been trustee for a while and still have questions, you can check out part three for complete answers. Understanding your duties as a trustee. When you agree to act as trustee, more is involved than just signing on the dotted line and then walking away. You're now obligated to do your best for the grantor in carrying out his or her wishes as set forth in the trust. Instructions, instrument, sorry which clarifies and specifies your duties. Chapter 10 discusses these duties, your grapple with the limits of fiduciary responsibility and discover what it means to honor the grantor's intent. And you explore to invest, how to invest the trust assets so that you not only protect the trust principle, but also produce the income that the, incomes, that the income beneficiary has a right to expect. Putting assets into trust. If you finally reach the stage where it's time to transfer the assets into a trust, either your own or someone else's, you need to know and follow certain rules in order to make a smooth transition from individual ownership to trust ownership. Chapter 11 expl explains how to smoothly make those transfers, whether during the grantor's lifetime or after his or her death. Putting the trust to work. After you transfer the assets into the trust, you as trustee have to create an investment plan that balances income production and growth against risk. Remember, the money in the trust isn't yours to play with. So you can't make any ridiculous gambles with it. Still, taking keep it safe and in the bank approach isn't smart either because the income beneficiary has a right and will expect income from the trust. This part doesn't entirely apply to us as secured party creditors, but. Chapter 12 gives you the pros and cons of a variety of investment options, as well as cluing you into some current investment theories. It also shows you how to factor in beneficiary needs when determining how to best invest the trust assets. Finally, it gives you a heads up as to what sort of fees the trust will incur. Fees that you have to factor into your calculations when you determine how much, if anything, you could pay to the beneficiaries. Discovering the purpose of the trust. A trust purpose and your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to balance income generation for the benefit <laughs> of the <laughs> current income beneficiary and principal dis distributions when permitted. With principal protection for the remainder interest, chapter 13 is where you unearth extra information you may want to consider as you handle the balancing act, such as the beneficiary's health, education, or other extraordinary circumstances. Figuring out which life events warrant additional distributions may be the trickiest part of trust administration. In chapter 13, you also discover why many trustees are likened to kindly relatives as you attempt to uncover all that you can about the income or the current beneficiary without being accused of stalking. Compiling and organizing trust records. Scroll back up here so you can follow along. You've done all the tricky stuff, but you still must track the activity correctly. Keeping records, although not difficult, is particularly fun, isn't particularly fun or exciting. So many people get sloppy about it. Our advice to you. Keep them neat. Stay on top of your record keeping means never finding yourself buried in an avalanche of paper you're not quite sure what to do with. 
Chapter 14 tells you how to maintain trust records with a minimum fuss and bother. Bringing the trust to its conclusion. Trusts sometimes seem to go on forever, but the day eventually comes when all trusts must come to an end. When that day comes, you need to know how to tie up all the loose ends neatly, like preparing and filing final tax returns and accounts and making the final distributions of the remaining income and assets. You've done a great job up until now. It would be a shame to ruin your track record and let, at, at this late date. Chapter 15 explains how to terminate the trust with a minimum of fuss and bother and call us crazy, but for us, life doesn't get much better than when we receive the last ascent to that final trust account, the one in which en the ending balance is zero. And we both know that zero balance means infinite wealth. That's what we want in double entry bookkeeping, which is all this is for us. For regular trusts, it's, it's a little bit different. But Paying Uncle Sam. Taxes in estates and trusts can be pretty involved. Why? Because you're not only dealing with income taxes, which, and we know how much everyone loves income taxes, but you may also be responsible for preparing Form 706, United States Estate and Generation Skipping Transfer tax return. Part four gives you an overview of the Form 706, the estate and trust income tax return, Form 1041, as well as the decedent's final form, 1040. It's not even my final form. Compiling the estate tax return. Not every estate is required to file a form 706, but if you must file, dive right into chapter 16, which takes you on a stroll through the lengthy estate tax return. Although the blank return may seem formidable, formidable, formidable geez, you may find that with help of the help of this chapter and the form 706 instructions, you're able to prepare all or at least large chunks of the return yourself. Chapter 17 goes into more depth and walks you through many of the schedules associated with Form 706. Give yourself some credit and take a stab at Form 706. You'll probably be surprised at how far you get. Even if you do end up taking this re return to a professional, you gain a much better handle on the, all the assets and the expenses of the estate by first attempting it yourself. Remember, if your decedent held, hang on, let me skip over here. After, after chapter one, we'll take a small chronic break. <laughs> sure, you're right. Remember, if your decedent held title to the property, whether in his name or alone as a joint tenant or in the name of his, ir or of, of his revocable trust, all the decedent's property is subject to the federal t estate tax. But of course, that's after a whopping exclusion of about $5.25 million in 2013, indexed annually for inflation. Figuring out the income taxes. Whether you're administrating your trust, excuse me, administering your trust, or are involved in an estate, you have to file annual income tax returns as long as either entity owns assets that are producing income. If you're the executor of an estate, you may also be responsible for filing the decedent's final income tax return, or maybe even his, his or her final two years of income tax returns, depending on when he or she died. We may have, we have you covered. Discover how fiduciary income taxes differ from personal income taxes in Chapter 18, and find out what quirks exist for the decedent's final tax returns armed with a uh, Form 1041, an income tax for estates and trusts, in one hand and a chapter eight and chapter 18 in the other, you can work your way through the trust or estate return preparation on a line by line basis. Planning an income tax strategy. There is rarely one way to skin a cat and the same can be said of preparing tax returns with little forethought and scheming. You can minimize the amount of income taxes paid by both trust and estate and the, and the income beneficiary. Chapter 19, we discuss how to legally reduce the amount of income taxes you pay to the IRS. Whipping together a Schedule K-1. Tax forms can be intimidating, especially unfair ones, and Schedule K-1 beneficiaries' share of income deductions, credits, etc. may seem overwhelming, but it's really not. In Chapter 20, see how the information from the 1041 translates to the Schedule K-1 when you've made distributions to a beneficiary from either a trust or an estate. 
after you figure out how to make the calculations, it almost becomes fun. Well, at least for us, but then we're an accountant and an attorney. And that's chapter one. We'll scroll up here and get ready for chapter two. And I'm going to set this down and I'm going to start to pack my bong real quick. So <laughs> I'm also I'm contemplating the idea of doing a more advanced book reading as well. Um, I recently came into possession of a beautiful gem that was recommended to me. Secured Transactions for the Practitioner. So, Can you explain, uh, go into a little detail what that means? So, as a secured party creditor, holder of the trust, operating the legal name and the legal fiction as your estate, um, all your transactions have to be secured. You're not dealing with paper anymore. That shit's for drug dealers and, you know, people going to the ATM to go to the store. That's it. From now on, you start dealing, once, once you get, once you're completely in place, you've got all of your UCC filings are done. You've done your 882 to bring your um, social securities into your estate. Um, you've done your DBA. You've got your FINS, your SAM, um, your death certificates done. You've got your diplomatic immunity passport. Once everything's done and you're ready to start moving forward and actually really discharging, because you, dis you can discharge as soon as you've got the trust set up. Um, <clears throat> whether or not they make it easy for you is, is, the, is the question. Now, um, discharging is a secured transaction. Okay. Anything that you do as a secured party creditor is a secured transaction. You're filing tax returns. The way that you file them is a secured transaction. The way that you deal with banks is a secured transaction because everything you do on paper is a contract. Every, every, last, every last thing that you do with all of these people is a contract. The difference, okay. between, right. you, the difference between you and everyday Joe Blow is that you know that. And you know that those contracts are actually negotiable instruments. And every time you leave a contract somewhere, you're leaving money on the table that you're supposed to go and recoup from the treasury. Because you're, mm. you're, you're leaving taxes on the table. And if you don't administer it, they will. And this is where I am right now. Um, how I got here is... Uh, I used to work for this guy who was a, a private lawyer and mm -hmm. uh, he taught me, he, you know, he, what he did was he did my UCC one, the 11 and the three. And uh, he said everything else that, that I would have to learn how to do myself, you know, figure it out, but he was going to get me on with that. And he told me not to use any of the stuff until I was um, sure how to use it being that you can get in trouble and they will railroad you and yep. drag you through the mud. Um, <clears throat> I did some bonds uh, in the court system. Um, I've sent about, shoot, at least seven, eight bonds to the treasury. Um, I, I, what Have I they been returned? Through, nope. Not going to return. Okay, so you're golden. Your shit is cured. Well, now, now it's it's about learning how to discharge. And my first one that I was going to start with is a uh, student loan. The Absolutely. Department, the Department of, of Education tried to railroad me. Um, I, I went because I was on disability. It was supposed to have been discharged. Um, they didn't do it. They said it, it came down to like the last four months. They sent me a piece of paper. Um, the like income statement and they said they didn't receive it, but I received a letter stating it was discharged. So now hang on, hang on a second. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, would you mind getting on, on cam so I can see who I'm talking to?
uh, let's see. If you can, if you can. Well, not a big deal. Just a pet peeve of mine. I like to conversate face to face. Right. Uh, I thought we were. You can't see me. share content. Um, um, but look down on your left hand of your screen. You should see a camera and a microphone. I should say start video. Oh, start video. There we go. What's going on, brother? Okay. All right. You got me now? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, so, so what to, the only thing I choice I have right now to, to squash that, uh, that garnishment is to go ahead and discharge it, uh, through yep. a, a secure party creditor. So I'm going to call the, have the, you, has 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 the student loan been sold to any to a debt collector? Yes, a couple of them. They pass it on to a couple of them. Then that, you go, baby. I, you that's go, what I don't go. understand, man. All, all you gotta do is some, all you gotta do is some uh, some dispute letters, man. Right, right. You can you can handle that without having to do the security party creditor process. I I know I know a cat that actually does that. He's got he's got an online business where he teaches people how to um, go that route with, with like student loans and credit cards. Cause it's a lot easier to do it through a dispute letter. Once the, once the debt's been sold because the obligation's already been fulfilled. Like it's already been fulfilled anyway out of your account, but coming at it from a consumer's perspective, you're probably going to be able to get it done faster than trying to come at it from a private administrative perspective. So send, sending the, the debt validation to the last person that they sold it to. Right. Okay. All right. I'll do that. That'll go out tomorrow then. Shit. Um, I've been... Do you, I ha am, do you have the three-letter process? Yeah. Okay. Um, I listened to Jack McCain. Oh, God. Please no. Hey, bro. It worked. It worked. I use his... his also, not, not only his um, What Lies in Your Debt. I'm yep. a member of theirs also. Yeah. Um, I Just be careful. Um... Be careful dealing with Jack. He screwed over a lot of people. So just, just be I got careful. The, I got the letters from a friend of mine. Do you know? Oh, Eric so you didn't. All right. Man? Huh? You know, Eric, the living man. Yes. I got him. I got him from Eric. And okay. uh, I, I did. I, I didn't. I didn't go through Jack because Jack cool, is cool. Acting, he's acting a lot of crazy ass money. I got the papers from him, but I didn't deal with him specifically. Um, I watched his videos. I, I did some stuff off his videos, and um, it worked. But he he's 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 doing some crazy shit over there. So I don't I don't really go chase him. Um, I go through li what lies in your debt because you know they follow you through the whole process. Um, the letters, um, going to court, teaching you how to how to go to court and win. <laughs> Um, so I, I give them my money every month. Um, but, but yeah, I, I did use his, uh, debt validation letters. Um, and they worked for you. That's cool shit, man. That's, yeah. that's cool. I'm, I'm happy for you on that. I'm gotta be honest. I'm a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be honest. I'm a little surprised because the stories that I've seen in my own personal experience of the garbage that he sent me in the beginning, just, when I first, when I was first introduced to him was when he first started doing things and I was I was naive I was just I was one step away from homeless and I had my ex-wife has cut me off from my son I haven't seen him seen him once in the last seven years and that was this last Christmas he reached out to me um and now I have some more firepower finally because now I have proof that he's trying to get in touch with me and she's not allowing it and um he had sent me some pay. I had paid a few hundred bucks for some paperwork from him. And it was, I tried it. It didn't get me nowhere. Um, tried to discharge the child support. And that, that put me in debt even, even, even worse. And then I ended up hooking up with my uncle and we went through another dude. That dude screwed us. And that was my uncle's money on that one. So I felt really, really bad. Um, so you still, do you still have this, uh, this, uh, debt with the child support? 
Oh yeah. I still okay, have Okay, I, I got a I got a friend that'll help you out with that. He did his from prison. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. We're doing big things here. We're doing big things. Hey bro, you give me your number. Um yeah, I'll, t- I'll text it to you. After, in, in, after. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ain't trying to put you know. You got to stay private, man. You got to stay private. <laughs> right. Uh, All right. You partake? You blaze? Yes, sir. Well, yes, why, ain't, sir. why ain't you up on this camera smoking a bone with me, man? Because I got to roll it up, man. <laughs> well, I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. They can wait for the small crime break. So I wouldn't. So I would interrupt you. I was gonna wait till you start reading again. Then I, it'll be a little bit quieter. <laughs> no, 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 don't you don't you worry. Let's do this thing. We we have to redo this. Let's make it comfortable. You know what I mean. I really don't want to be here this time of night. I should be in bed right now getting my beauty sleep. As you know, a pimp gotta get his blue beauty sleep. <laughs> I show you right. Hey, if you wanna, if you wanna, uh, you know. Because I've been going since seven o'clock this morning. We I didn't had basketball tournament this <sighs> weekend and. I was sitting up here, my eyes dozing off on you, and I was slapping myself and stuff like that. So, uh, if if you if you're trying to say you're tired and you want to bounce, brother, you can go. I got to get this last chapter out anyway because the people showed up for two chapters, so the first video has got to be two chapters no matter what. So I'm gonna be here reading this last chapter regardless. I'll listen in while I'm rolling, one, bro. All right. Keep you. All right. So chapter two, exploring the ins and outs of estates. In this chapter, classifying the estate differently for probate administration and tax purposes, knowing what to do regardless of whether the decedent left a will, determining who inherits, figuring out how to define the estate for tax purposes. When you're named as an executor or an administrator of an estate for the first or second or third time, you may have some questions as to what exactly an estate is and about the whole probate estate and tax estate process in general. Before you can administer an estate, you need to have a firm grasp on what an estate is. Don't worry though, you don't have to become an estate and trust attorney. We provide you with the ABCs of estates right here. Consider it your entry level course to understand the basics on estates. This chapter defines Many reasons why you shouldn't smoke before you read because you get cotton mouth and the many terms associated with the estates lays out the process of determining who inherits and explains the difference between the estate as it is defined for probate purposes or estate tax purposes. So read on, dip your toe in or take a plunge. We think you'll end up with a firmer grasp on estates. Defining the estate for probate administration purposes. In order to administer an estate, you want to know what you're administering. Although an estate may appear to be a confusing legal entity, you don't need to be concerned about all the technicalities. All you need to know about a probate estate is assets of a person owned at his or her death that that are subject to probate administration. Proving to a probate court that the will is genuine, Chapter 6 walks you through the specific stages of the probate process. All right, next page. Scroll up here. All right. <clears throat> So what type of assets compromise a probate estate? Check out the following. All assets held in the decedent's deceased person's name alone. All assets the decedent owned as a tenant in common with one or more other persons. A tenant in common holds property together with other tenants in common, but none of the tenants automatically inherit the the shares of a tenant who dies. Each tenant holds an equal share of the property unless the property title specifies otherwise. Upon the decedent's death, his or her share becomes subject to probate, even though in some states actual title to real estate, if that's what it is they're holding, 
passes to the heirs as of the decedent's death. All assets payable to the estate because the, either the estate is designated beneficiary or the asset has no designated beneficiary, such as life insurance, on the deceased employee benefits. Amount owed to the decedent before death, but paid after death, such as decedent's last paycheck and other amounts due to the decedent's estate by reason of his or her death, such as an award from a wrongful death suit. And last, household items, jewelry, and other items that don't usually have a title unless the decedent has, in writing, declared them to belong to his or her revo revocable living trust during life. See Chapter 3 for more on revocable living trusts. Chapter 7 includes a complete list of assets to look for as an executor or administrator, many of which end up in the probate or estate for one of these reasons. Remember, if an asset is the decedent's name, if an asset is in the decedent's name alone for conveyance only but really belongs to another individual, for instance, the decedent was holding it for a relative who was incapacitated, the person claiming ownership of the property must furnish proof that it actually belongs to him or her. The asset then goes to the actual owner or his or her representative instead of becoming a part of the decedent's estate for administration or estate tax purposes. For example, Mary listed the only signer on her husband's daughter's, on her husband's, on her disabled daughter. Wow, what the fuck? I shouldn't have smoked. For example, Mary listed as the only signer on her disabled daughter Sue's checking account. There we go. Which is funded solely by Sue's monthly disability payments. If Mary dies, Sue or someone acting for her, if she is unable to act for herself, must provide documentation that the account and the money in it actually belongs to Sue and not Mary. This proof may be in the form of a letter between Sue and Mary mentioning the arrangement, check stubs from the disability payments, and bank statements. After that documentation is in order, you have the proof you need to exclude this particular bank account from Mary's estate, both for probate and tax purposes. Most assets that are subject to probate administration come under supervision of the probate or equivalent court in the place where the decedent lived at death. The one exception to this rule is real estate. You must probate real estate in the county and state in which it is located. If the estate you're responsible for has real estate in another jurisdiction, including out-of-state real estate, you need to have a nuclear administration separate probate of the property in the jurisdiction where it's located in addition to probate in the decedent state of residence. E chapter six for more on determining the domicile. I'll scroll down here. Willpower, understanding how a will or no will affects an estate. Whether or not the decedent left a will determines what form of probate you undertake. And this section gives you a look at the effect of having and not having a will. A will requires you to file a petition with the probate court and have it admitted to probate. A will probably names you as executor, so you don't have to worry about applying for the job. If the decedent didn't leave a will, you file a petition to the administer to administer the estate, to administer the interstate estate. Say that three times, Ross. <clears throat> And other folks who feel that they're just as qualified may file a petition as well. If more than one person applies to be administrator, the court decides who gets the privilege. Whether the decedent left a will also determines whether the decedent's wishes with a will or state laws in a decedent's state domicile with no will determines whom the assets will go to. Domicile is the decedent's legal home. It's decided by a combination of factors, including where the decedent lived for more than half of the calendar year, was registered to vote and registered any cars, plus the addresses he or she used on income tax returns, and any other supporting factors. See Chapter 6 for a complete discussion of domicile.
and on the plants. Dying is testate. <laughs> That's the weed, brother. Mm. Apologies to everybody watching this video after it's recorded. My bad. Hey, man. As long as we get the knowledge out you of know, it. You know, you know. And why not have a good time at the same time? You know? I'm trying to tell you. I'm saying. A decedent dies to estate if he or she leaves a valid will. The will then undergoes a probate according to the laws of the decedent's domicile at the time of death. The purpose of probate is for the court to rule on the validity of the will and supervise the administration of the estate. What determines the validity of a will, it's based on individual state law. For instance, in most, if not all states, a will writer must be at least 18 years old and of sound mind, <clears throat> knows, ha, known as having testamentary capacity. This will must and must usually be in writing, typed or handwritten, and signed by the decedent or another at the decedent's discretion and in his or her presence. The following list gives you an overview of some common types of wills. Holographic. A holographic will is written in the decedent's own handwriting, dated and signed, but may or may not be witnessed. It's valid in some, but not all jurisdictions. However, people are more likely to challenge it and if, if it and challenge it and if questions come up about the decedent's intentions which won't be as clear as a lawyer crafted document the probate court interprets those intentions let me scoot over a page here Attested. An attested will is usually prepared and typed by an attorney's office and signed by the decedent and two, or in some states three, witnesses who receive no benefit under the will. This is the most typical kind of will. Oral will. An oral will also known as a non-cuptive non will is a spoken orally is spoken orally to another person and not written down. A few, a few states recognize them in extreme circumstances such as imminent death. Other issues affecting validity are whether the testator was under undue influence from another in making the will, whether fraud was committed against the testator, whether he or she had knowledge of the contents of the will, and whether the will is a forgery. If you as executor are aware of any issues affecting the, vali the, va affecting the validity of the will or have any doubts as to its validity. They're just throw throwing that freaking word in there to fuck me up over and over again, ain't they? <laughs> uh, for reals. <laughs> Not like I didn't say it right perfect the first 14 times. You should bring this to the attention of the pro probate court. So I'll say that again. I'll, I'll say that sentence again. If you as executor are aware of any issues affecting the validity of the will or have any doubts as to its validity, you should bring it to the attention of the probate court. Bam! <laughs> dying, inter <laughs> dying intestate. Or intestate. Yep. Just a different emphasis on a different syllable. A decedent dies intestate if he or she leaves no will. The law of intestacy also applies if a will turns out to be invalid and the decedent had no prior valid will. Reasons the will may be declared invalid include forged wills, wills not pro properly witnessed, a decedent who, hasn't, who wasn't of sound mind when he or she signed the will, and fraud undue influence on the decedent during the writing of the will. If the decedent died intestate, the law of the decedent state of domicile govern both how the state is administered and who inherits the estate. Check out the next session, taking a look 
at who can inherit for more information on how intestacy works or affects the estate. We've both administered estates where the decedent died intestate and experienced, experienced challenges to the will. Intestacy can be an uncomfortable situation because the laws of intestacy frequently don't follow what you would have been, what would have been the decedent's wishes. For example, depending on the decedent's state of domicile, if one spouse dies without a will, the surviving spouse won't inherit everything unless the decedent has, has no children and in some cases, other blood relatives with claims to the estate. If minor children are involved, a court-appointed guardian must hold their shares with assets supervised by the court and the child reaches adulthood. Of course, that arrangement works out best for the court-appointed guardian who may not have even known the decedent or the family and who is well paid by the estate to manage those assets and the expenses of raising that child. And guess who the guardian is in our state, in our case? The government. So they're right. getting well paid for their role. And we just ain't, you know, handling shit right. The court also decides who will be the guardian of the child's person who will raise, who will raise the child if both parents are deceased or if the court considers the surviving parent to be unfit. Note that one person can be guardian of both the person and the property of a child if the court deems that appropriate. Sometimes more than one family member or family friend feels strongly that he or she is the best person to raise the child, in which case things can get messy. Most parents prefer to take that, make that choice for themselves, and the court will honor their wishes if the court finds it's in the child's best interest. But we actually know several people who have delayed creating wills because they don't want to face the guardianship question, either because they don't want to offend family members or because they feel they have no choice of good guardians. That's sad. Right. Taking a look at who can hear if you're serving as an executor or administrator of an estate, one of the first things you need to do is determine who inherits the estate's assets. If the estate has, val has a valid will, determining who gets what, what is usually straightforward because the will sets out who the assets go to. However, wills can be fuzzy if they're not well drafted, and sometimes beneficiaries can be hard to track down. If the decedent left no valid will, you have to rely on laws of intestacy, intestacy sorry, to figure out who gets what. The following section walks you through the people who can potentially inherit something from an estate. Surviving spouse. If the decedent was married at the time of his or her death, his or her surviving spouse becomes a major player in the eventual disposition of the estate, whether or not the decedent had a valid will. If the estate is willless, the surviving spouse is entitled to a share of the decedent's estate dictated by the intestacy laws of the decedent's state of residence. When there is a valid will, the surviving spouse has a choice. A, he or she can choose to take any inheritance stated under the will, or B, he or she can elect to take against the will. That is, to receive the share that he or she is entitled to by statute, known as the statutory share, rather than the amount he or she stands to inherit under the will. Generally, the, spouse statutory, the spouse's statutory share isn't as generous as the spouse's interstate share, the share he or she would receive if the decedent died without a will, and they're definitely two different animals. I scroll all the way down, all right. The next section takes a closer look at these choices. Appendix B shows you the rules for inter interstate shares, state by state. Remember, in certain instances, such as when surviving sp the surviving spouse's own estate is taxable without any addition from the decedent's estate, It may not be in the best interest of the surviving spouse. It may not be the surviving spouse's best interest for the estate tax purposes 
to accept any inheritance from the decedent. In this case, the surviving spouse should disclaim or refuse by a legal document any part of either what the descendant left him or her under the will or the spousal portion of the estate determined by the interstate statute. See chapter 8 for, for details on disclaimers. Inheriting under the will. In the most common scenario we see, the surviving spouse chooses to inherit whatever the will provides for him or her in accordance with the decedent's wishes. Most spouse, spouses plan their states together and execute their wills at the same time. They typically have a common purpose in mind. Take care of the survivor during his or her lifetime, along with any children if they're minors. Their plans typically mirror each other's. These sorts of wills are often referred to as reciprocal. Reciprocal, sorry. How did I butcher that? I know that word. Where each will gives everything except for bequests of specific personal property to, to the other, and only after the second death does the property pass out to the wider family. Taking against the will. Each spouse has the right to leave his or her property by will to whomever he or she wants. To offset that right, the surviving spouse has the right to take an amount allowed by statute rather than the amount, if any, left to the spouse under the will. For a variety of reasons, such a second, such a second marriage where the decedent wants to favor the children from the first marriage in his or her will, or the spouses aren't amicable before the decedent's death, the surviving spouse may get less under the will than he or she would receive by taking his or her statutory share. That's when the surviving spouse may decide to take against the will. See chapter six for a fuller discussion of the spouse's decision of whether to take against the will. Don't forget the spousal statutory share is not the same beast as the state statutory share. Every state has spousal statutory share. Any prenuptial agreement, an agreement signed before marriage, think movie stars, billionaires, and second marriages, or postnuptial agreement, an agreement signed after marriages that the surviving spouse signed that set out or limited the amount he or she would inherit upon the decedent's death will govern and to no doubt waives the statutory, statutory share. Surviving spouse's allowance. Most states have a provision for a surviving spouse allowance. For instance, under the new Massachusetts probate code enacted in 2012, surviving spouse has the right to live in the home of the decedent for six months plus a reasonable allowance in money out of the estate during the administration of the estate for the maintenance of the surviving spouse and the decedent's minor and dependent children. These amounts are intended to help the surviving spouse and or children through the estate administration period. See chapter six for more on this provision. <clears throat> no such thing as a free ride. Goodbye, dowry, dower and courtesy. Where are we at? All right. I'll scroll down past that title. Or you can get more of the page. All right. Although the surviving spouse's statutory share has largely replaced the old concepts of dower and courtesy, they're worth mentioning. Dower and courtesy, defined in the following paragraphs, have now been abolished in most states or replaced by dower for both surviving spouses. Under the old laws of dower and courtesy, the widower's share was far greater than the widow's. The definition of dower may vary from state to state, but typically it's a provision that gives a widow not usually defined as any surviving spouse, a life estate, the use of or the rest for the use of a life estate, the use of for the rest of the, his or her life in a portion of all real estate owned by the decedent at death. Dower has been abolished in many states and greatly altered in others. Courtesy, on the other hand, is generally defined as the widower's right to a life estate in all the real estate his deceased wife owned at death. Courtesy has been abolished or greatly altered in most states and replaced by some dower for both widow and widower. See chapter six for more information. 
individuals omitted from the decedent's will, including intentional disinheritance. Another group of individuals not included in a will may have a right to inherit some assets in an estate. These individuals, called pretermitted heirs, are usually children or issue of a deceased child. All persons who have been descended from that child, like a grandchild of the descendant. If the will doesn't include them, they may elect to take care they would have received under the intestacy. Split that word up and it always, because they split it up at the end of a sentence going down to the next line. Fuck me up. Unless the decedent provided for them during for his or her lifetime, or it's shown that the omission was intentional. The purpose of this policy is to avoid the unintentional disinheritance of a child or the other issue of a decedent. For example, and I like this one because I'm named after his brother, Robert Kennedy's youngest child, daughter's, daughter Rory, was born after his death. If in his will he, he left bequests to all his children by name, not naming Rory, she could argue that she was left out by mistake and thus was a pretermitted heir, entitled to her interstate share. Of course, the Kennedys had good estate planners, so they would never have named specific children without allowing for ones to be born later, and they used trust for, pri for privacy. So this example is just a what if. See Chapter 6 for more on pretermitted heirs. Intentional omissions, including disinheritance, are generally fairly obvious because most com competently prepared wills have a provision stating whether the person making the will, the testator, intended to provide for the children born after the will was made or for any children or other issue or other relatives not mentioned in the will. Typically, where there's been a family falling out, you find language in the will stating that this or that child or other relative Let me scoot over. Holy Zoom. Back it up. Back it up. Too much I'm going to jump. All right. Typically, where there's been a family falling out, you find language in the will stating that this or that child or other relative has been intentionally left out or has been left one dollar. Sometimes a will contains, contains language stating that a child or other family member was left out because he or she has been adequately provided for in his or her lifetime by other means. The other players. Devices and legal teas. That was dangerous. Almost hit the power cord. Other people may have a claim to inheriting the assets in a decedent's estate. The decedent may have may name anyone to inherit under his or her will, subject to the rights of the surviving spouse and or minor and the dependent children. Following are a few technical names for you to ponder while you figure out who all players are in the estate you're administering. Residuary divisi, a person or entity named to receive all the real property not specifically devised left by the will. Specific divisi, a person or entity named to receive specific real property or real estate under a will. Residuary legalty, a person or entity named to receive all the personal personality not specifically disposed under a, disposed of under a will. That should be personal tea. Sorry. Specific legacy. A person or entity named to receive a legacy, personal tea or personal property disposed of by the will. Heirs at law. Heirs at law are the most are those people who inherit a person's estate under the state statutes of descendant and distribution if he or she died intestate without a will. For example, Massachusetts resident John Doe dies without a will, survived only by his wife Mariah, no children, and great-aunt Ophelia. Aw, oh, Ophelia. 
from whom he is estranged. Poor Ophelia. Under the intestacy statute, his surviving wife inherits the first 200,000 of assets, and the rest are split half to his wife and half to great aunt Ophelia. Good old Ophelia. If John had children, his estate would have gone as follows. Everything split half to his wife, half to his children. If John Doe is survived by his wife and no other relatives of any degree, his wife receives everything. Statutes vary from state to state, and we lay out the results of all of them in Appendix B. Defining the estate for tax purposes. How many pages I got left here? Throat's getting a little sore. The probate process is intended to ensure a smooth transfer of property from the decedent to the beneficiary, <clears throat> where no other means of transferring the property is in place. However, the federal and state tax authorities are much more concerned with how much the decedent's property they can take accordingly. Concerned with how much of the decedent's property they can take, they can tax and accordingly allow for a much broader definition of what the decedent owned at the time of his or her death. Although the probate estate includes only property in the decedent's name alone or payable to the estate for estate tax purposes, all property owned by the decedent in any form, including jointly held in a revocable trust and any property payable to any person in the probate estate as a result of the decedent's death, is includable in the taxable estate, and you may have to deal with more than one type of tax. Each tax on the decedent estate also has a specific purpose. The following sections take a closer look at the types of taxes an estate may need to pay. Part four expands on the specifics and what you need to do as an executor with these taxes. Transfer taxes. Transfer taxes are taxes on a person's right to transfer property and are levied on the value of property as it passes from one person to another through gift or inheritance. Although the following taxes go by different names, gift tax, estate tax, and generation skipping transfer tax, they're all part of the same umbrella system of taxing the transfer of property, because that's legal. Annual exclusion of gifts. Gifts that are limited to annual exclusion amount, the amount in which transferred per donee without incurring gift tax per year, the annual exclusion amount in 2013 is 14000 per donee and is reviewed annually with periodic increases to deal with inflation. In addition, a husband and wife can split gifts from either of them. So together they can give 28000 per donee or two times the annual exclusion amount in 2013 without using any of their lifetime exemptions. Gifts to a spouse. You may give an unlimited amount to your spouse, provided your spouse is a U.S. citizen. If your spouse isn't a citizen, the exclusion amount in 2013 is 143000 This amount also adjusts periodically for inflation. Hmm. I wonder how that would work if you're an American national. Because you're technically not a U.S. citizen. <clears throat> Moving on. Tuition and medical expenses paid for someone else. Just make sure that you write the checks directly to the school, the hospital, or the doctor. If you make a mistake and write the check to your deserving niece or nephew directly, even if he or she, she turns right around and pays the tuition, that gift isn't unlimited. You may find you just made a gift that requires a gift tax return form 709, or even worse, a gift return tax, a gift tax return and a gift tax. Gifts to political organizations and gifts to qualified charities. Qualified charities have obtained tax exempt status from the IRS. There is also a lifetime unrefined credit that can be applied against any gift tax. Any use of this un. Just, wow, did I really just say unified as unified? <sighs> I'm too tired, bro. There's yeah. also a lifetime unified credit that can be applied against any gift tax. Any use of this unified credit during the life 
reduces the use of the unified credit against the federal estate tax upon death. Check out the explanation of the unified credit and how it works in chapter 16, which to us really doesn't matter much because we're unlimited. Right. But <clears throat> you stop there. Pick up. When you supposed to do another class? Uh, next Sunday. I got one. I got two pages left. I'll just finish it out. You can go if you want to, man. I ain't going to force you to stay. Oh, no. I'm good. I'm learning some stuff here. I'm going to grab me some water. Oh, yeah. yeah I know. I am, stuff. too. I'm like, this is my second time through. And I'm like, oh, I didn't catch that first time through. Right. And and this this book is just uh, uh, um, like that series of dummies books. Yep. Yep. And this one's an old one, actually. This one's 2013 or 2012. Something. I don't know. 2014. Sorry. The only reason I don't want to I don't want to go and uh, spend the money for it, man, is I got about freaking thirteen trust books sitting up here in my files. I just haven't ran across anybody or a group of people that that specifically work at dealing with trust that I can take all of this knowledge and piece it together. You know, that's all I'm missing. Man. Then I can be able to help somebody else. You feel me? Right. That's what, that's what I'm trying to get to. I got, man, I got big, big plans. I got big, big plans. I want to talk to John Hutchison, Ralph Ring, Michael Tellinger, uh, Genesis 2 Church. All of these people have access to technologies that can heal everything in the human race and provide free energy and free levitation, all that shit. And I want to get them in a think tank. Man, you sound like me. Bro, I ain't playing. Like, I have, I'm working for this, um, this little mom and pop spot. It's a, uh, called Harvest Time Natural Foods. It's a, um, holistic, you know, vitamins, herbal medicine. We got a whole wall of just herbs, bro. Fresh herbs that come in every week. And you name it, we got it. Unless it's like super rare, super, super rare, we got it. Bro, the owners are ready to sell the place. And I told them about my trust. And they're like, well, we want to make sure that we sell it to somebody that cares about the business. I live and breathe holistic medicine, bro. Like, it's what I do. Because I cured myself of asthma using oregano oil, homie. <laughs> and right. so... I was also in the holistic pet food industry for a few years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to offer to buy that store from them. I'm going to blow it up. I'm going to turn it into an all around wellness center, wellness and knowledge center. It's going to be free food for anybody that comes in. They can, they can do their, they can do their grocery shopping. I'm going to offer them. I'm going to offer everybody $200 a month per visit worth of food that they can just come in and get. I'm going to have the store. So it's like mad stuff. Up. So people have to fill out applications and whatnot for it. And then I'm also going to give them the option to learn how to become a secured party creditor. So they don't have to do it. So they don't, that they don't have to end up using the, the end up using the program to get food. You know what I mean? Like the whole idea is oh. to to remove the whole idea is to remove all of the costs that weigh people down so that they can afford to put their paperwork forward and take control of their estates. Right. And if I can do that for a mass amount of people, imagine what happens. Right. Like imme immediate expansion. So Wow. Give me a second, man. Let me grab my charger. Yep. Yeah. So, like, are you doing this with uh, uh, bonds and promissory notes, or, or how, are you, how are you funding the project? That's just it. Once you get to a certain point with all of this, <coughs> so those bonds that you sent into the treasury – Right. Once you get to a certain point, you're pulling off of those bonds. But you don't even have to pull off of those bonds because you can still pull out of the treasury. 
this is where I'm at, bro. Okay, listen, um, my friend, I have this. I, I, I just moved from Washington down here to Arizona. <laughs> I'm from Phoenix, brother. <laughs> is that right? Where are, you, where are you at? I, I live in Maine right now, but I'm from Phoenix originally. Sure, you're right. I'm loving it down here. Yep. Uh, so, uh, so I had a nonprofit organization um, teaching life skills through basketball. <clears throat> having to do all of the the fundraisers through the parents through the kids and things like that and I always I always knew that somehow I can put a bond a, a trust together and um and and then fund the program with bonds and promissory notes yeah <clears throat> Well, it's because we have unlimited right to contract. And, we, and you know, when, you, when it gets down to it, somebody had to start this shit somehow. Right. Somebody had to make these bonds to begin with. So if they made something out of nothing, who the fuck are they that we ain't? So I'm, 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 so I'm thinking um, promissory notes in the form of a check and the routing number to the treasury department through the tda account and i get the hard lock removed first that's where everybody's been fucking up they didn't file with the tda and get the, the medallion seal for the account authorization to where they got the okay to go in they just ran in and just used the fucking routing numbers thinking that that's okay and it is okay if you do it right okay so i re i i i i have the account through the tda I missed another part. I have oh. the account and the account number and the routing. I believe the routing number. Did have you have okay, so hang on. All right. So this is my TDA form. Hey, should we should we finish the first the the next two the last two pages and then Yeah, I'm just going to show you real quick. <laughs> I'm okay. already here, so I'm just going to show you real quick. This is All the right. TDA form that gives you your account, right? Uh-huh. You need to make sure that that box is checked. It, the 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 uh picture's too small, I can't see it. Okay. It says check for hard lock to remove hard lock. That's what you want. You need that hard lock removed. Now you've got the account, you've got the number, but you don't have the authorization to use the account yet. And it's not authorized and it's not complete until you've gotten the medallion stamp from a federal agent at a bank like Fidelity or Jones. And then you mail it back to um uh crap okay I so i did all of that process and and i received a a email um and a letter from them stating that i can use the account so i must have oh checked so the then box. yeah then you should be okay. good okay so you're in big boy status then you should you should be yeah you should be making you should be making promissory notes you should be getting ready did you get your sam registration yet SAM registration. I'm going to say no. All right. So look into your SAM registration and your FINS number. You got your DBA? Nope. <clears throat> All right. So you need your DBA. See, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could say what I need to say on here. Um, All right. Hold up. Being recorded. Hold okay. up. We'll, we'll finish this up and then we'll, we'll stop the recording. We'll talk after the meeting. Okay. I'll try and get this up quick. Sorry, everybody, but you know, y'all, y'all know how this game goes. Y'all know that when power start powwow and shit's got to pop off. But we will do a recording on what we what we're gonna talk about offline because we peaked some ears and some people want to know. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, I, I ain't. I, I don't hide nothing except for what needs to stay private as far as to protect the trust. You know what I mean? Other yeah, than that, 
other than that, I put, you know, cause I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a point where I've got a, a non-disclosure agreement and I don't want to, to, but yeah. Okay. So federal gift tax, the federal gift tax is a tax on the transfer of property from one person, the donor to another, the donee with no payment or less than full payment in return. Watch it because the gift tax is triggered whether the person transferring the property intended to make it a gift or not. Federal estate tax. Federal estate tax, sometimes mistakenly referred to as the death tax, is a tax on the transfer of property at death. All property the decedent owns or has an interest in at death in whatever form it's held is subject to the tax. Only about 2% of estates are actually subject to the estate tax because of an exemption amount Based on the unified credit, see chapter 16 for an explanation of how the unified credit is, de is determined, which is 5.12 million, million for 2012. See chapter 16 for a more in-depth information on the federal estate tax and what you need to do as the executor. Oh, I am like way off as far as pages go. <laughs> All right, we're, there we go. We're good. We're good. It's my fault, people. I got it distracted. <laughs> <laughs> um, generation skipping transfer tax. This is something that you're, that you're going to need to learn about more in-depthly for sure. Someone that, someone that I'm learning from mentions this as a, as a very important thing to get, get information yeah. on. Okay. So the generation skipping transfer GST tax is a relatively new invention intended to ensure that the federal government gets a slice of the pie each and every time assets move from one generation to the next. As a result, more and more people, uh, as a result of more and more people discovering that they may be able to pay less overall transfer tax by bypassing their children and giving property directly to their grandchildren or even better, great-grandchildren. Congress plugged this particular loophole so the gift tax and estate tax can no longer be evaded at any generational level by skipping a generation on the transfer. And so now, rules trigger the GST tax anytime a transfer is made that skips a generation, with the exception of transfers made into irrevocable trust, trust, can't, trust that can't be amended, created before September 25th, 1985, which are grandfathered into the GST tax. That basically means anybody, uh, any one of us that has any friggin' knowledge of this shit, because that's like, I mean, 1985, you're 30 years old. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So anything, anything before 1985 is all grandfathered in. So we're good. We don't have to. That's why he mentioned it. Oh, okay. All right. The GST tax doesn't apply to gifts that aren't subject to the gift tax. Note, a transfer of property to a grandchild is normally considered a direct skip and is subject to the GST tax. However, if that grandchild's parents has already died at the time of transfer, the transfer is not subject to the GST tax. If property is left in trust for life for a child, at the child's death, there will be one of the following. A, an estate payable because the, st the child had enough control over the trust that it's considered to be owned by him or her and is included in his or her taxable estate, or B, a GST tax payable because the, term of the, tr the terms of the trust are restrictive enough that the property is not considered to be owned by the child, so the GST tax is triggered because the generation has been skipped. Your volume went down, man. Move closer to the mic. Is that it? Nope. <clears throat> there you go. How about now? The GST tax is also applied to the transfers to or for an unrelated person who is 37 and a half or more years younger than the transfer. I just turned 38 today. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you. What the IRS has determined to be the equivalent of skipping a generation. As you can see, there is just no getting around it. 
a transfer tax is going to be paid at every generation after you pass the exemption threshold. State, estate, inheritance, and other transfer taxes. State transfer taxes are in a state of flux due to fairly recent changes in the federal state estate tax law. Until 2005, there was a credit against the state tax due on the federal estate tax return for, for state death taxes paid with the limit on the amount of the credit based on the size of the taxable estate. That credit was abolished as of 2005. Unfortunately, state death taxes paid may now be taken only as a deduction against the amount of the federal taxable estate, and deductions are never worth as much as your pocket in your pocket as credits. Many states had or still have an estate tax system which is variously known as pickup sponge or slack tax system because it's designed to collect tax only on the amount allowed as a state tax credit on the federal estate tax return. Of course, when the federal credit was eliminated, the state the state estate tax source was also eliminated for the states with this system, causing a loss of significant tax revenues. Understandably, a lot of states were unhappy with this as a result, some enacted new estate tax laws to make up for the disappearance of their estate tax and resulting loss of revenue. However, other states are choosing not to impose a tax or raise the amount which is exempt from the estate tax. Some states have an inheritance tax, which taxes the amount inherited by a particular beneficiary rather than the estate as a whole. The tax rate depends upon the relationship of the beneficiary to the descendant, sorry, to the decedent, and the tax is payable to the beneficiary. Although some decedent's wills may provide that the estate is to pay all inheritance taxes. Overall, slightly less than half of all states currently have an estate or inheritance tax, and there are an, <clears throat> and there are movements afoot in several states to eliminate the estate or inheritance tax. Almost there. All right. Other taxes. No, you're not out of the tax woods yet, but at least the taxes should be somewhat more familiar to you from your, from your personal tax life. Federal income tax for decedent and estate. You must prepare and file a decedent's final federal tax income tax return, as well as an income tax return for the estate for every year in its, ex in its existence. The estate income tax return does have some differences from the individual return, all of which are explained fully in Chapter 18. Last page. <clears throat> All right. Scroll this bad boy down a little bit here. State income tax for decedent and estate. If the decedent was domiciled, had his or her legal place of residence, see Chapter 6 for more inf information on determining domicile, in a state that has an income tax, you must also prepare and file the final state income tax return for the decedent and an estate income tax return for each year the estate is in existence. I'm saying that three times. You can't because I had to do it the last time around and it didn't work out very well. State intangibles tax. If your decedent was domiciled in a state which has intangibles tax, a tax on certain intangible assets owned by the decedent, such as stocks and bonds, and if he or she had assets subject to the tax, you must prepare and file the final intangibles tax return for the decedent, as well as the returns for the estate if required. You may also find that prior year tax returns for the decedent were never filed. This is surprisingly common and must be filed in order to close the decedent's estate. You can check with your local probate or equivalent court to see whether this is the requirement in your jurisdiction. And that, my friends, is the end of Chapter 2. <laughs> and with that, I will say, holy shit, the second time around was a lot more informative than the first. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're, you're going to love digging into this the second time around. So to everybody that's watching this now in the future, 
Um, thank you very much um, for your support and showing up. Um, I'm trying to do this freely as I possibly can. Um, <clears throat> I am only working a part-time job and, you know, obviously any donations for my time would be appreciated. That's not me, you know, asking for money for services rendered and, you know, it's 14 bucks for the membership for zoom that I didn't really realize I was going to have to pay. I thought that was going to be, you know, free, but it is what it is. Cost of doing business. Once I get there, I'm not really too worried about it, but anyway, to everybody that's out there and joining me and my uncle Russ, who's not here with us now, but will be in future meetings. Um, he's my trustee. Um, I want to say thank you for joining on this journey because we ain't got nobody but each other to get us out of this. And everybody's too busy being money hungry and saying, I can't share nothing with you until you give me something first. And, you know, I get it. I get it. People want compensation for their time. I get it. that people want, you know, they got to make a living, but yo, I've done all this and I did it at times when I was homeless and I didn't have a job and I, I still made it happen. So there's no excuse. You can, you can do it. You know, it's, it's hustle, it's time, it's energy, but you can do it. So to everybody out there, thank you. Have a blessed night. Namaste.